Hey, squirrels, I'm in here and it's only 8.22. And we're on chapter 15. Think. Let me make sure. <laughs> it's not going to let this blackbird bogey divert him from the logical and sober investigation. Blah, 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 blah. I think this is right. We'll know. I'm sorry, Miss Fortescue, to bother you again, but I want to be quite, quite clear about this. As far as we know, you were the last person, or rather the last person but one, to see Mrs. Fortescue alive. It was about 20 past 5 when you left the drawing room. About then, said Elaine, I, I can't say exactly, she added defensively. One doesn't look at clocks the whole time. No, of course not. During the time that you were alone with Mrs. Fortescue after the others had left, what did you talk about? Does it matter what we talked about? Probably not, said Inspector Neal, but it might give me some clue as to what was in Mrs. Fortescue's mind. You mean you think she might have done it herself? Inspector Neal noticed the brightening on her face. It would certainly be a very convenient solution as far as the family was concerned. Inspector Neal did not think it was true for a moment. Adele Fortescue was not, to his mind, a suicidal type. Even if she had poisoned her husband and was convinced the crime was about to be brought home to her, she would not, he thought, have ever thought of killing herself. She would have been sure, optimistically, that even if she were tried for murder, she would be sure to be acquitted. He was not, however, averse to allaying Fortescue's entertaining the hypothesis. He said, therefore, quite truthfully, there's a possibility of it, at least, Miss Fortescue. Now, perhaps you'll tell me just what your conversation was about. Well, it, it was really about my affairs, Elaine hesitated. Your affairs being? He paused questioning, questioningly with a genial expression. I, a friend of mine had just arrived in the neighborhood, and I was asking Adele if she would have any objection to my asking him to stay here at the house. Ah, and who is this friend? It's a uh, Mr. Gerald Wright. He's a schoolmaster. He's staying at the Golf Hotel. A very close friend, perhaps? Inspector Neal gave an avuncular beam, which added at least 15 years to his age. We may expect an interesting announcement shortly, perhaps. He felt almost compunction as he saw the awkward gesture of the girl's hand and the flush on her face. She was in love with the fellow, all right. We were not actually engaged, and of course we couldn't have it announced just now, but, well, yes, I think we do. I mean, we are going to get married. Congratulations, said Inspector Neal pleasantly. Mr. Wright is staying at the Golf Hotel, you say? How long has he been there? I wired him when Father died, and he came at once. I see, said Inspector Neal. He used this favorite phrase of his in a friendly and reassuring way. I see. What did Miss For Mrs. Fortescue say when you asked her about his coming here? Oh, she said, all right, I could have anybody I pleased. She was nice about it then? Not exactly nice. I mean, she said, yes, what else did she say? Again, Elaine flushed. Oh, something stupid about my being able to do a lot better for myself now. It was the sort of thing Adele would say. Ah, well, said Inspector Neal soothingly, relations say these sort of things. Yes, yes, they do, but people often find it difficult to, to appreciate Gerald properly. He's an intellectual, you see, and he's got a lot of unconventional and progressive ideas that people don't like. That's why he didn't get on with your father? Elaine flushed hotly. 
father was very prejudiced and unjust. He hurt Gerald's feelings. In fact, Gerald was so upset by my father's attitude that he went off, and I didn't hear from him for weeks. And probably wouldn't have heard from him now if your father hadn't died and left you a packet of money, Inspector Neal thought aloud. He said, was there any more conversation between you and Mrs. Fortescue? No, no, I don't think so. And that was about 25 past 5. And Mrs. Fortescue was found dead at 5 minutes to 6. You didn't return to the room during that, that half hour? No. What were you doing? I, I went for a short walk to the golf hotel. I, well, yes, but Gerald wasn't in. Inspector Neal said, I see again, but this time with a rather dismissive effect. Elaine Fortescue got up and said, Is that all? That's all. Thank you, Miss Fortescue. As she got up to go, Neil said casually, You can't tell me anything about blackbirds, can you? She stared at him. Blackbirds? You mean the ones in the pie? They would be in the pie, the inspector thought to himself. He merely said, When was this? Oh, three or four months ago, and there were some on Father's desk, too. He was furious. Furious, was he? Did he ask a lot of questions? Yes, of course, but we couldn't find out who put them there. Have you any idea why he was so angry? Well, it was rather a hard thing to do, wasn't it? Neil looked thoughtfully at her, but he did not see any signs of evasion in her face. He said, oh... Just one more thing, Miss Fortescue. Do you know if your stepmother made a will at any time? I've no idea. I suppose so. People usually do, don't they? They should do, but it doesn't always follow. Have you made a will yourself, Miss Fortescue? N no, no, I haven't. Up to now, I haven't had anything to leave. Now, of course... He saw the realization of the changed position come into her eyes. Yes, he said, 50,000 pounds is quite a responsibility. It changes a lot of things, Miss Fortescue. Part 2 For some minutes after Elaine Fortescue left the room, Inspector Neal sat staring in front of him thoughtfully. He had indeed new food for thought. Mary Dove's statement that she had seen a man in the garden at approximately 4.35 opened up certain new possibilities. That is, of course, if Mary Dove was speaking the truth. It was never Inspector Neal's habit to assume that anyone was speaking the truth. But examine her statement as he might, he could see no real reason why she should have lied. He was inclined to think that Mary Dove was speaking the truth when she spoke of having seen a man in the garden. It was quite clear that man could not have been Lancelot Fortescue, although her reason for assuming that it was quite natural... Oh, gosh. I've got a pain in my head. Under the circumstances... It had not been Lancelot Fortescue, but it had been a man about the height and build of Lancelot, and if there had been a man in the garden at that particular time, moreover, a man moving furtively, as it seemed to judge from the way he had crept behind the yew hedges, then that certainly opened up a line of thought. Oh, dear. Sleep, Socks are killing me. Sorry, I keep. Oh my gosh. I'm doing that all day long whenever I'm wearing these doggone things. Oh, I gotta call Liz and get me some. Don't have feet in them. <laughs> then my feet will be blown up like I don't know what. Where was I? Added to the statement of hers, there had been the further statement that she heard someone moving about upstairs. That, in its turn, tied up with something else. The small piece of mud he had found on the floor of Adele Fortescue's boudoir. 
Inspector Neal's mind dwelt on the small, dainty desk in that room, pretty little sham antique with a rather obvious secret drawer in it. There had been three letters in that drawer, letters written by Vivian Dubois, so she didn't burn them all to Adele. A great many love letters of one kind or another had passed through Inspector Neal's hands in the course of his career. He was acquainted with passionate letters, foolish letters, sentimental, sentimental letters, and nagging letters. There had also been cautious letters. Inspector Neal was inclined to classify these three as of the latter kind. Da -da 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 -da. Even if he read... Even if read in divorce court, they could pass as inspired by a merely platonic friendship. Though in this case, platonic friendship, my foot, thought the inspector inelegantly. Neil, when he had found the letters, had sent them up at once to the yard, since at that time the main question was whether the public prosecutor's office thought there was sufficient evidence to proceed with the case against uh, okay against Adele Fortescue or Adele Fortescue and Vivian Dubois together everything had pointed towards Rex Fortescue having been poisoned by his wife with or without her lovers connivance. These letters, though cautious, made it fairly clear that Vivian Dubois was her lover. But there had not been in the wording so far as Inspector Neal could see any signs of incitement to crime. There might have been incitement of a spoken kind, but Vivian Dubois would be far too cautious to put anything of that kind down on paper. Inspector Neal surmised accurately that Vivian Dubois had asked Adele Fortescue to destroy his letters and that Adele Fortescue had told him she had done so. Well, now they had two more deaths on their hands and that meant, or should mean, that Adele Fortescue had not killed her husband unless... That is, Inspector Neal considered a new hypothesis. Adele Fortescue had wanted to marry Vivian Dubois, and Vivian Dubois had wanted not Adele Fortescue, but Adele Fortescue's 100,000 pounds, which would come to her on the death of her husband. He had assumed, perhaps, that Rex Fortescue's death would be put down to natural causes, some kind of seizure or stroke. After all, everybody seemed to be worried over Rex Fortescue's health during the last year. Parenthetically, Inspector Neal said to himself that he must look into that question. He had subconscious feeling that it might be important in some way. To continue Rex Fortescue's death had not gone according to plan. It had been diagnosed without loss of time as poisoning and the correct poison named. Supposing that Adele Fortescue and Vivian Dubois had been guilty, what state would they be in then? There was a question. Vivian Dubois would not have been... Would... Vivian Dubois would have been scared, and Adele Fortescue would have lost her head. She might have done or said foolish things. She might have rung up Dubois on the telephone, talking indiscreetly in a way that he would have realized might have been overheard in U Tree Lodge. What would Vivian Dubois have done next? It was early as yet to try and answer that question, but Inspector Neal proposed very shortly to make inquiries at the Golf Hotel as to whether Dubois had been in or out of the hotel between the hours of 4.15 and 6 o'clock. Vivian Dubois was tall and dark like Lance. He might have slipped through the garden to the side door. Might uh, no, wait a minute, side door, made his way upstairs, and then what? Looked for the letters and found them gone? 
waited there perhaps till the coast was clear, then come down into the hop into the library when tea was over, and Adele Fortescue was alone. But all this was going too fast. Neil had questioned Mary Dove and Elaine Fortescue. He must see now what Percival Fortescue's wife had to say. And that is all of chapter 15. And I think that's going to be it for the night, y'all. I know it was short. But just so I don't get reading crazy. Crazy stuff and my eyes doing crazy things. And I can read all of that next. Should be able to read all of chapter 16 next time. Love y'all. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Bye-bye.